Welcome to Experiences Canada's podcast series from the National Youth Forum 2024 on Reconciliation. This podcast series was led by 60 Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth in their own voices. It is the first podcast platform of its kind that provides an opportunity for youth to add their voices to the national dialogue towards truth and reconciliation. Today's podcast explores indigenization of classrooms or workplaces and is researched and hosted by Ethan, Wasea, Mariah, Grace, and Catherine. Thank you to Misty Dawn for guiding them through these important conversations and powerful stories so we can learn from their experiences. Please be aware that this podcast includes discussions on injustices and violence against Indigenous peoples in Canada. In the spirit of reconciliation, we aim to increase awareness of these injustices and encourage listeners to actively engage in these tough conversations with sensitivity and respect. Hi, I'm Mariah. Hi, I'm Wasea. I am Ethan. I'm Grace. I'm Catherine. We should also explain where we're all from. Yeah, I'm from the public sector, but I live in Winnipeg, but I'm from Small Lake First Nation. I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm from Sydney, Nova Scotia. I'm from Lindsay, Ontario. Welcome to our podcast on the indigenization of education. Uh, we'll start by defining uh, indigenization. Since we're all individuals from different parts of the country, how about we give our own personal understanding and view on indigenization from where we're from specifically? Indigenization moves beyond tokenist gestures of recognition or inclusion to meaningfully change practices and structures. Examples of indigenization in education could include the inclusion of indigenous readings, adoption of indigenous learning approaches in the classroom. We are going to jump into discussing uh, what each of us, what experience each of us have had seeing indigenization in our education. All of us are in high school, so we've had a substantial chunk of school. I'm done school, almost done, almost done, almost done, uh, almost, done. almost done. So we're all we're all almost out of it. <laughs> Why don't you take us away with your uh, experience uh, learning about um, indigenous people in school? Well, um, in Nova Scotia, personally. Um, with reconciliation and the things we learn about it in my specific uh, school and the um, classes that I'm in, uh, we don't touch base on it a lot. We do Orange Shirt Day once a year, and besides that, we don't really talk and touch base much in other cultures and everything, and I really uh, would like if we could possibly in the future do that more so, but it's just a thing specifically within like my school board that is just not something that's provided with our education system. And I really don't find that fair, considering a lot of other people I've talked to, uh, also specifically with this whole podcast trip, that they have been learning this since forever, when I realistically have stopped learning about it since probably early middle school, and I would really like to be able to touch base on it more so, um, especially since it's still happening, and um, there's definitely a lot I still need to learn about, there's a lot I really need to learn, but um, I feel like with the education system, they could help us learn that, something that's more of use to us besides more politics that really won't mean anything to us yet. We have a very similar experience in Canada. I mean, no, in Ontario. Yeah. And Typical yeah. Ontarians. <laughs> hey, you you have your nut pad. We'll talk. Referring <laughs> to the whole country, the province of Ontario is the whole country. <laughs> yes, Ontario. <laughs> okay. We have a very similar um, experience here, for instance, in Ontario, where the curriculum does not outline that we need to learn Indigenous history, especially mm -hmm. in high school. There have been no mentions of Indigenous units in my history class, and the only reason why I was sometimes in it is because my, his my teacher, I guess, interested in it. Mm -hmm. But we are never required to write any essays or yeah. tests or memorize anything. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of an afterthought. Right, yeah. For us, like, we're not even really allowed to talk about it. Like, it's not, like, teachers aren't even allowed to touch base on it because it contradicts with so many other cultures and beliefs that they don't even want to go down that, like, they don't want to go down that road because of all the problems that it could cause. But realistically, it's something they're just trying to sweep under the rug and avoid when, because that's the easier option besides actually talking about it. Yeah, to say I'm a little horrified by that approach would be a bit of an understatement. Mm -hmm. In Ontario's curriculum, it doesn't state that Indigenous history or even modern-day understanding of Indigenous culture mm -hmm. is required or mandatory. 
The only goal of the Ontario's Indigenous Framework for the Pirate is their goal is only to lessen the success gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous students. There's no focus on trying to incorporate understanding or mutual respect between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous in mm -hmm. their schools. Absolutely. Well, you said you said it's very horrifying. I like an understatement that uh, how scary our curriculum is. So, what's the difference between ours and yours? Oh well, this is, okay. Saskatchewan is a little special um, because we were, okay. We were the first province to mandate treaty education um, from K through twelve learning, and it is an outcome in every class. Uh, generally, it'll be formative for some classes, and it won't get covered in math because that doesn't make sense. But uh, it, generally, you will see um, Indigenous learning in just about every class you'll be in. I mean, we had in drama, we um, were led through um, specific Indigenous improv games. Uh, then in, in English, we've uh, learned about residential schools. In history, and at this point, uh, our History 30 course is getting to be indistinguishable from our Indigenous Studies 30 course. And that's really how it should be. The history of Canada is the history of its Indigenous people. And yesterday, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, asking people who are here uh, if they could tell me what the Indian Act was. And the majority could not tell me. They were, it's an act or it's a set of laws that we're not good. And that's sort of where the understanding of it stopped. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that's foundational to our nation like that should not be forgotten about. And very likely it's being swept under the rug mm -hmm. by uh, some people who feel perhaps a little bit of shame or perhaps just don't want you knowing it at all. Yeah. And just even you mentioning that, the two things that people said that they knew about it, I didn't know either of that. That's never something that I've been taught in any of the games. I knew nothing about it. But that's just what my education system provided for me, which is less than. And I, my teacher just like maybe said that term once in a passing con like conversation with me and mm -hmm. two classmates, but then after that, it's never mentioned in the official curriculum. If anything, anything. it's avoided. Right. Mm. Well, what about you two? You two are from two other places mm. as well. I'm from yeah. Um, where I'm from, I mean, like basically, I'm in the middle of like the country. So like at my school, where I go like in the city, we actually cover like really good like indigenous topics like like just in general like we have one short day I think maybe like once or or sometimes like twice a year they would bring um, power dancers to like the school and we, we would go into the senior gym and then like and then the dancers would dance and then at the end they would have like a whole like um, into tribal at the end. And um, for Red Dress Day, like um, some like some indigenous people, they were like go to the art room and like and like paint, and also like have a walk, like around the neighborhood for Red Dress Day, and and class wise, um, they also like did like a good job like do, like like teaching like indigenous topics like in English like like I didn't have social studies this year because like um I, I I can't remember if I didn't choose it or maybe it wasn't assigned to me but in English we like did like essays on it I remember we did a, we read a, like indigenous novel it's called The Merrill Thieves uh, if you got if you don't know what that book is I read that one in grade ten. Yeah, th yeah, that's what we did for um our novel study in English, and and also like at school too, they had like a language program, but like, and I don't know what happened to it. Like they they would like teach like indigenous language, um for England as part of that program, but like I haven't like heard much of it since, and it's been like a year or like maybe two years but and also like last year um our principal retired so we had a new principal this year who was who was indigenous and like <clears throat> and like the um, indigenization was starting to come back 
So yeah, it's basically my story of the transition in classrooms. Uh, and do, okay, do you know if um, what you've learned was to curriculum or was it more um, teacher preference, teacher preference yeah. and teaching? I think it was, it was both. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I want to add on to what you think because just like I feel like indigenous languages should be offered just like how French language is yeah. offered. In Absolutely, yeah. yeah. At my school, we do have a Mi'kmaq language class, but we learn very brief terms and like little words, like the names of like birds, fish, whatever, little things like that, but nothing that could be put into conversation. And we learn no history behind it whatsoever. Yeah, I know it. Um, <clears throat> like around like Southern Manitoba, I remember. Um, it was a Dakota reserve, and like after school, they had like um, pieces of paper like on like walls that mean like in Dakota, and like 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 door, cabinet, table, that kind of stuff. But like it's not really like it's, like um, in the city as much. Mm -hmm. And also a little story of mine when I was younger, in grade five, um, <clears throat> I had to learn French. Um, it, and also they tried to make it mandatory. And my parents, when my parents found out, like they got they got like mad because like I'm indigenous, I shouldn't be learning French. It's not like they don't want me to learn French. It's so just, they want to learn the language connected to the culture. Yeah, exactly. Cause like they can cause like my parents they consider and I hate to say this, but like a colonizer language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My uh my aunt Heather taught, um, she was teaching high school at Carleton, that's in Prince Albert, that's their only public high school, uh, and they wanted to offer a course in Cree language, uh, and they asked my Aunt Heather to do it. She doesn't speak Cree notably, she just happens to be Métis. Uh, she considered trying to learn Cree to teach that course, uh, and eventually decided against it, and they couldn't offer the course. But... <laughs> So there, there is an attempt, and that is a big problem. As you get out of Saskatoon and Regina, our two major cities, it, indigenization of the classroom drops notably. Um, like you see less and less of it, and that is, uh, rural Saskatchewan is a different place than the cities. They are slow to catch on to everything. They still use rocks as tools, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, little Mariah, here's a little Mariah. Okay, uh, so, yeah, uh, other school was offering, was trying to offer French, and so the elders there, they weren't very happy about it, and so we got, after that incident, we had, um, one of the elders who speak the name couldn't try to teach it, and we've had an Asian American teacher for, like, uh, two years now. Clearly all of our curriculums are extremely different from each other but um yeah. i would have to say that definitely more of it should be put into the curriculum because all of all of us had something negative to say about the lack of teachings of it and we're all from different areas of the country so it seems to be one commonality that there isn't enough of it throughout all of it which i think really i didn't think i'd end up here in my thinking but as i'm sort of pondering this discussion I'm sort of turning against provincial education. Like I, uh, really? I've been wondering, <laughs> I've thought for a long time that this should have been a federal uh, mandate. Uh, it is kind of, a, it is a bizarre thing that five different Canadians can all have vastly different experiences with the education system. <laughs> so, <laughs> but all one commonality of there is not enough of it being taught. To be so real, I feel like our education in New England is like not as advanced as like the cities that you guys, like the schools you guys go to, because I'm here and like I feel so uneducated. Like I am educated and like I know it and <laughs> but not to the extent I know it should. in my head. But, yes. But when I try to like speak it, like try to say what I'm thinking, I can't really do that. Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's funny, in Saskatchewan, they call me a fast talker. They're like, why do you talk so fast? That's suspicious. <laughs> and uh, the people in Saskatchewan, they talk so slow. I, I get um, 
I get annoyed with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we, you get that experience in rural Saskatchewan. All like there often are not uh, teachers who are the most qualified there because that's where they can get a job. In the cities, it's very competitive. Rural Saskatchewan, they're excited that someone's willing to live out there. So um, they can have a very different educational experience. And obviously, you live in a very small town in a very remote area of the country. So you don't ever need to feel like you're less educated than anyone here. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Our school is like, it's very messy. But our teachers, they expect you to go fast. And then, like, if you're going to go, like, be in a halls or something, or spending time in the bathroom or in the library all day, they don't, they don't really, like, associate with that and they just let the kids be well mm -hmm. they try to be as strict as they can but the kids yeah. are like there's only so much I can be done they're <laughs> they go to school just for the sake to go but not yeah, the motivation some not kids, the motivation some to be educated some kids don't have anywhere to go exactly yeah they I just feel like because they have nowhere else to go yeah. but then therefore they're doing the experience to everybody else because it's just the um, majority yeah. who are just doing what they please because they have nothing else to do and yeah. it's really and an experience some, for everyone. Some kids, their parents can drink for days, like, mm -hmm. yeah, and they just have nowhere else to go and you get emotionally attached to the teachers. Mm -hmm. So like, they know all, you get so emotionally attached to them that they care about your education and they boost you to go to school mm -hmm. and they try to get all these indigenous kids to like, Especially since you live in yeah. such a small area, and everyone knows everyone. All our history is like in a small town with all the abuse and all the drugs and all the alcohol use, mm -hmm. with all the tra trauma that the, they go through. Yeah, of course. The teachers want us to do better, so like, um, to lead by example and maybe help with yeah. others because the more of their peers they see, you know. Yeah, for example, for me. Being here, my high school, like the high school people, like not people, but the kids at my school, they, me being here makes them more um, motivated to do good things like graduating or like um, going to your classes, going to your school, classes, going out and like talking about yeah, these things, yeah, socializing, embracing culture, yeah, putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. It's, I like it because. A lot of my, when, when they found out how, that I was coming here, they were like, oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And, like, they, they just looked up to me, and I really like that. And I, I encouraged them to go to school, and, like, um, it's nice for them to have a fresh it, example to, like, look yeah, up to. And that's it's good to have a full class. It's good to have a full classroom. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because most of my classes, there's like max three to five people mm -hmm. to show up to school. And it gets very, like, not lonely, but like... It's not at the level it should be. Yeah. And like, maybe like 40% graduate and the mm -hmm. rest are like dropouts. Yeah. And, like, my school is highly the same uh, for about like, the same reasons. Yeah. Where, but in my school, so many people don't have somewhere to go or don't have anywhere to go but then they lose motivation to go to school entirely and then that's why they end up on the streets yeah. and that's where the pot like the homeless pot like population is so high because people are no longer given the motivation to get educated and go to school because even people who have a full university degree and are working all the time and living in an apartment that they're sharing with six people they can't afford to live yeah. because like prices of everything are insane and yeah. <laughs> you know and no one can really live anymore so what's the point of going through school for these extra years when you're gonna end up being the exact same place anyway yeah and the, the things that these kids go to it's not very easy and to be at school and try to do these things you're kind of they're kind of sensitive and like mm -hmm. it's being in a school where your culture and everything like that is not taught and you feel like you don't belong because none of it is taught and you feel like, well, who am I? You don't know who you are and you're not 
helping and you or helping some, you. Yeah, some of them mm -hmm. don't realize that the situation they're in with their household and what they're going through is wrong. Yeah, so like, it's all they about. don't really talk about it and mm -hmm. like they just think that all is weight is what everyone else goes through, so they don't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. And when they do talk about it, it's usually with the teachers, and that's why you get so like <laughs> attached to them. Yeah. You get such a good bond. Absolutely, you build a relationship with yeah. the teachers, and then when you stop showing up, it becomes a modern day issue. I would say it's pretty indigenous there. We have we have school dancing, we have short singing, uh, after school activities like that. Um, retreat days, we really we like we have posters and we do all this art and yeah yeah it's very nice. I love that. Throat singing fascinates me. It's one of the only ways that you can uh, allow deeper tones in your voice than what the natural fallout point of your voice mm -hmm. is. And it's, when you do it with someone, it's, it's you're communicating in such a different way and it's so beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So uh, we're gonna talk about university in a, in yeah. a, we're gonna move on there. We're gonna transition there. Yeah, and I think we can start in with me because uh, I have a really cool university program I'm going into next year mm -hmm. that is a very direct connection to indigenization of education. It is the Saskatchewan Urban Native Teacher Education Program. It is a four-year program where at the end of it, you receive your Bachelor of Education degree uh, and so in this program, they are training Métis uh, people to be teachers, to get them into the workplace. This is doing a few things. It's counteracting years of uh, sort of pe people who've been blocked from entering post-secondary education by many means, systemically dis designed against them getting there. Uh, this year, my history teacher, uh, Tracy Laverty, shout out to you, Tracy. Uh, she went through the Sunset program 30 years ago. So Auntie Tracy uh, went through the Sunset program and her intern also went through it. And that's when they recommended it to me. So um, what this is doing is it is uh, putting more indigenous or Métis people into uh, Saskatchewan classrooms uh, to help in the process of indigenizing uh, the workplaces in uh, education. So it's a very cool thing that they're doing there. Okay, during this trip with Students of Canada, we visited CUNY and when the Carleton president spoke about how Carleton is um, putting indigenous <laughs> name or naming indigenous places. No, yeah, naming places with indigenous names. And when we visited the Zili zip line, they were also explaining how they were in the process of naming and building parts in respect to indigenous people. And it's really important in the process of reconciliation um, with the land, especially in the Carleton to land claims and how we are on unceded territories. Yes. Yeah. Saskatchewan, most of Saskatchewan sits on Treaty 6 territory. So that's the land acknowledgement that you hear everywhere. Uh, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 land and the traditional homeland of the Métis. So it's been interesting here uh, to hear the words unceded land so much because I that's the phrase that I while I've heard the word seated before I have not uh, heard it used in this context before. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Saskatchewan in the prairies. It's been uh, it's different. See, the Sask Party got into power the year I was born, and the NDP before them had created treaty education. Uh, they were ready. They were ready to roll it out, and then they get out of power. And the Sask Party just decided to let it roll out anyway. They just continued with that. And that's probably the my favorite thing they've ever done in their eighteen years in power. Uh, Give a list of your I have a list of my favorite things. It's that and nothing else. <laughs> okay, so I know what it was going to say. So in Manila, we don't have universities. I yeah. mean, yeah. not one. No. Really? Yeah. Are there? Just because of the population of the area. Yeah. What is yeah. the? We have a college <laughs> in each community, but nobody goes there. Yeah. Is there at all a university in the territories, um, across the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and the Yukon? Um, we don't have universities in Nunavut. 
<laughs> they aren't sure about the other yeah. two yeah. territories. Yeah. Um, so, and with our education, it's like limited, not limited, but you have to go to another school after you're done high school with your, with your 100 credits. We, well, yeah, we have 100 credits at our school, and that's five credits per class. And when you graduate, you have all these classes, but you don't have the requirements. They don't offer the requirements to be in university. So after you're done high school, you have to go to another school to get those requirements so you can get into a, a university. Right. So that's 20 classes. I, I, 20 um, classes. Okay, so I know in high school, work. in grade, grade 10 to 12, you have uh, two semesters per year. And per semester, you get 20 credits. Because that's, um, I think that's five classes. Yeah, five, four classes, four classes per semester, oh, okay. and each class um, requires, and you get five credits for it. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, in Saskatchewan, a class is equal to one credit, and you need 24 to get out of there, uh, and you do you can do five classes in a semester, it would be considered mm -hmm. a full course load. Mm -hmm. In um, my school specifically, each class is one or, well, it can go half, one, one and a half, or two, depending mm -hmm. on which class you take, and you need 16 credits. Yeah, and okay, so you need specific credits to graduate. Uh, yeah. In Saskatchewan, you need uh, a social credit for 10, 11, 12, and your, your options in grade 10 are Indigenous Studies, 10 or history 10 and then um indigenous studies 30 on the 30 level or history 30 but we sort of got into how those aren't that different in saskatchewan anymore yeah, yeah. whereas okay what is your experiences with social studies been specifically because that is where you generally find indigenous history and learning in, um, the, in the classroom social studies for us we had social studies from uh, i think fifth grade to eighth grade and all I ever remember learning was about um, just uh, random people from history that we did little projects on. And besides that, we never really learned that much. We did a project on residential schools in fourth and fifth grade. And besides that, I don't think we really ever touched base on the topic again. Mm -hmm. um, in Ontario, I think we started from grade one to eight. And Around our middle school, I'd say, is when we would start learning about Indigenous history from a little, we, little tad bits of Indigenous history. Mm -hmm. But we, <laughs> we would be talking about settlers and how their classes when they arrived here. Um, I, I don't think that it was very much the focus ever in our education system for Indigenous history. Mm -hmm. like that, that, that yeah. Once history. again, it's what we swept up and the rug for both of us. I wanted to talk about, in regards to land treaties, how here when we say it, we do it every single week in announcements, um, but I have a feeling that not a lot of people really pay attention to it, or not a lot of people actually know what it means. Um, and when we came here in the of Canada, we talked about how it's important to listen to locals and understand their culture, but we have not connected with our locals at all. And I think it is important that we do that and we want to reduce that. One. I find out of oh, Sorry, can we circle back real quick? You said that you did a land acknowledgement every Monday over your school announcements? Yes. That is a brilliant idea. It I is, see, yeah. I've just read, I've been, I read the school announcements for all of grade 12 every day. I never missed a day. And not once did we do that. That would have been a brilliant idea. I should have met you a year ago. I would have brought that there. I would have re I would have introduced that immediately and then continued hearing every single day. Hey, what did you read on the announcements? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Um, but I find here we connected more with the people who shared their stories because it was a personal connection and not just read off a piece of paper like as I presented, it's probably why people aren't listening to it and aren't hearing it because it's pre presented to them in such a blind way of like, oh, they'll listen if they want to. It's like not pitched to them in a way where they want to pay attention, they want to whatever. But the whole trip here, like they're so like in depth and you connect with them and they share the sort personally and 
you can ask so many questions that I find you really like grabbed a lot more information out of that rather than just like spewing it out off of a piece of paper when that's why I find like our education systems specifically need more people to um, educate us from their personal stories instead of just um, mantling it and yeah. I do think Ontario is progressing though because we recently, my school had honor of hosting our community's Tara ceremony mm -hmm. and a lot of the elementary students got to go and experience that. Um, the high school students, however, we didn't really like, get to do that because it was exams and fall meeting time and so mm -hmm. they didn't let us. <laughs> I mean, okay, we, 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 we've sort of touched on it a little bit, but that's why it's important to have Indigenous people working as teachers in education, oh, or even absolutely. being guests into classrooms, to be speaking. My history teacher, Tracy Laverty, showed out again. Um, she did an entire lesson just about her own family and her history and where she'd come from. Uh, and I found out that uh, we're very tenuously related to each other. Like, you trace way back. You know, what was it? It was end of 18. Nunavut was, um, was, it wasn't Nunavut, it was end of BC. End of BC was a whole big, um, part the North of Territories had just yeah, covered yeah, it just everything covered every until day. like 1996. Somewhere. It was like 1999. It was like 19, Eight, no, 1989. My, my grandfather, my grandfather was in the Yeah, and my man too. My she's big on politics too so like I know everything so um <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah from um from my school like so like this year like for, like about the whole na land acknowledgement of your guys' story so in my school um for our like land acknowledgement this year like um with our new principal um, he decided he wanted to do the acknowledgement in Cree. So, like, every single day, five days a week, the, um, at 9 a.m., we we listen to the acknowledgement in Cree, which is so very good because before, like, it was just, like, English. And, like, and thank you, Mr. Crowchild. Shout out to him. He's our principal. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> Shout out. Shout out. Workplaces? Are we going to get to workplaces? I've been working since I was 12. Is that legal? Um, at the store? No. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> okay, so I've worked yeah. at the store since since I was 12. Well, what's your, with the personal experience you have with the new various jobs that you work with, Danny, what is your personal take on the digitalization of the workplace, just out of your experience, anything you connect it to? Um, it's... It's none of it, so it's very, very indigenized. So mm -hmm. it's like, um, I'm not sure how to explain it. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that there's a lot of, um, do you find that it, there's a lot of like issues with it, or is it like, mm -hmm. like oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues because some of, uh, um, okay, so um, most people rely on tribal packs. I do not. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure many of our new and listeners at home have no clue. These parents, yeah. they make, no. they, oh, well, they basically make babies kids so they can get child tax. Mm -hmm. And it's, they use the money to use alcohol and mm -hmm. drugs and they're addicts. And so these kids, they like, they, everyone uh, treats them like criminals. Well, mm -hmm. they, and the child tax is basically just money that's given to them from the government. Yeah, just these kids, kids, yeah. They're treated yeah. like they're criminal, like, 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 full on criminals, and they're really not. Well, they just, they just have of... a history. Yeah. And that's all these people who are hiring, that's all they see when they see these kids. And they don't know their history and what they've been through. Mm -hmm. And they judge the people by it. And they judge them by their history and not by them as a person. As a person, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's really hard for some indigenous to like 
get a job up there. So, so, like, so there's a lack of opportunities. Yeah, there's, yeah. yeah. And this summer, um, I was talking. I was talking to my uh, my aunt and uncle about this. Mm-hmm. Well, not yeah, and so I <laughs> I basically told them this summer you could hire about like six to seven summer students, and they did, and that's what they're doing, and they hired like a lot of kids, and they. I think it's their first job, so it's like... So in none of it, do you think things are getting better? Yes. A little bit. A little bit better. It's slow, but it's It's, getting there? It's getting there. Do you see in your lifetime that it's going to be turned around? Um, Yeah, I I expect it because the people at our school, they're trying really hard to, like, kind of, like kind of way better at school and like you can tell and like um you can see everyone trying to put yes. in the effort and trying to make a change specifically yes. because they know and it's getting needed. a little bit more strict at school and mm-hmm. when it does these kids don't take it very well so like yeah they try to rebuttal against it because yeah, it's and, something they don't um we try to like calm them down and explain to them what is really happening and from our perspective, because in their perspective, they're like, they don't know what's really going on from... Mm-hmm. Like, they're very, like, blindsided to the whole thing, too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I understand that. Um, well, I've had a few jobs in the past and everything, and I really can't personally connect it to that much, because where I'm specifically from, there is not, and where I work, there is not a lot of Indigenous people I've worked with. Especially, like, I was a camp counselor for two summers, and I don't think any of the kids that I worked with or anything, like, I, I, it if, was very... If they were indigenous, would that be something they'd be open about? Um, if where I live, probably not. If they were white passing, would they ever mention it? Hmm? If they were white passing, would they ever mention that they were indigenous, ever? That's a really good question. You don't know? I don't know. It depends. In my city, it really depends on, like, what area you're in, because... Some people are so judgmental and so, like, if you are different from them, then they will take it in such a wrong way. And it's one of those things where where I live, everybody is very, um, everything is very divided no matter where you live. Like, one area has, like, the people who have taken advantage of, like, having a lot of children and using, like, what we call baby bonus and taking all that money and getting into drugs and alcohol and then their kids are left for whatever and... Um, every area has their specific group of people, and it's very, I don't want to call it a clique, but, <laughs> like, everyone's in their own little space. When you're describing it, it sounds like the purge. Um, Halifax is a very big city, a very busy city, and there's so many people in there, and so many different people, and even just going around the city, I was in the city right before I came up here, and, um, you can see just like the way that downtown set up for the tourists, they make everything look perfect and make everything look okay. But once you really get to settle in and see what it is, everybody is so divided into where they are told they should belong. And so no one really oversteps those boundaries because they're told not to. And everyone's just so like blindsided by it. No one really wakes up and realizes how wrong it is. And because there's so many people, one person oversteps the line and there's like way too, it's like and that, so many of them. That starts with education. Oh, absolutely. And then it builds to Absolutely. It's just lack of education. Same with mine. I'm just, I, like, most people don't see any issue in there being no education on it because they're like, why aren't we learning about white people? Yeah. It's the same kind of thing of, like, everyone's just so washed to being so self-centered and not realizing exactly what went on. And I feel like that's their entire goal because yeah. they don't want to be seen as the ones who caused the whole situation and especially the fact that it's still going on and they're still not talking about it. This whole expedition here to Ottawa has disheartened me a little bit. Uh, for many years, I just sort of thought, I mean, education around in um, the treaties and Indigenous people and their history has been so forefront that the tide has to be turning right now. People are hyper aware of what has happened in the history. And coming here, we're sort of, I'm sort of waking up to the fact that 
the majority of the country still has not been educated in this. It's something my grandparents talk about this all the time. Growing up, they didn't know residential schools were a thing, and there were residential schools 10 miles from where they lived. Mm -hmm. And sort of infamously, the last one closed in Saskatchewan in 1996. So when my dad was still in high school, they were still, I know he's old. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, dad. Indigenization of the classroom is very important. I have had uh, indigenous and Métis teachers and as a Métis student who is uh, very light-skinned, won't be recognized as Métis by anyone unless I tell them, it means so much to see my people working in schools and being role models to me. I look forward greatly to a few years down the line when I will be that person to someone. And that to me is why it's so important, is that it will change the minds of every person who is unaware of it, and who doesn't know about this, who it might even be prejudiced or bigoted, that we could start changing the tides on that one. Mm -hmm. And that people who are indigenous will have people representing them in education and that there will be opportunities for them to find work in the future. Mm -hmm. As someone who is non-indigenous, I think that um, reconciliation and indigenization of the classrooms is also important because it is firstly unconstitutional and the acts that we did in the past must be um, re remembered so that the actions don't happen again in the future. Mm -hmm. In addition, I also think that just as how we recognize French and how they have used a notwithstanding clause, it should be implemented and they should be able to use the notwithstanding clause for indigenous. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I find this podcast is very important for all of us, especially since every single one of us, one of us is from a very different part of Canada and it's all very diverse with all different education systems, yet we all still have the same standpoint of we're not being taught all that we want. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing where it's, I always thought it was maybe just where I lived or anywhere, but clearly no matter what part you're in, they're still trying to hide some of it seemingly or they're not putting in the effort they should to educate everybody on it. And so many people are blindsided for that, but I do think that that should be something that's mainly prioritized above a lot of other things that are. Let's, let's call out some people right quick. Oh no. Government, oh, government of all oh, of the maritimes. We call the government for everything. Governments, yeah, governments. of the Maritimes, uh, Ontario. I would like uh, to say Ontario because Ontario ran things. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but, but specifically on the topic of education, all of the Maritimes, Ontario, uh, Alberta, British Columbia, uh, the territories, and the rest of them. <laughs> everyone who's not Saskatchewan. Put this in your curriculum. It would be an easy thing to do. The classes already exist. The content already exists. The resources exist. All you need to do is make sure everyone's learning it. If you were to remove Holocaust education from the curriculum, there would be rioting in the streets. No, because of how it's with Ontario, for example, we like say things, but we never do things because it's so easy to say. And I feel like it's so for the entire process of the cause of action to say that we're going to do it every single year. And then how, and how is the progress in? We can get eight, I think, yeah. the votes out of the Yeah. Game. The Canadian government, they organized a genocide against an entire people. Uh, and tried not just to destroy them, but when that failed, assimilate them. But we still exist. Yeah, we're still we here. To learn. We're here! And when you start talking about that, that's when things are actually going to change. So start an education, build it into the workplace. You guys have any closing thoughts? No, I think no. we're okay. all... No. Why, don't, why don't we conclude this? Um, the matrix word for thank you is Marcy. So... Marcy, you, yeah. and you. In my language, we say Kwana. 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 In my language is Miigwech. That's how you say thank you in Ojibwe. Yeah. Miigwech. Yeah. Why don't we all say thank you to our listeners in our language? One, two, three. Marcy! Yeah.
Experiences Canada, providing young Canadians with once-in-a-lifetime experiential learning opportunities since 1936. Learn more by visiting experiencescanada.ca and follow us on social media at Experiences Canada. Thank you to Youth Ottawa for partnering with us for the production of these podcasts, and thank you to Canadian Heritage for funding Experiences Canada's first-ever in-person forum towards reconciliation.